Graeme Finlay is co-director of New Zealand Christians in Science and author of several books exploring faith and evolution. In this fascinating talk, Graeme makes two big claims. First, that life is order formed from randomness. And second, that life is relationship in community. In both of these, he sees the character of God and the hand of God at work in creating and upholding life. This talk was part of the That's Life Seminar Day held in Christchurch in October 2022. Wonderfully integrated talk, and I love that idea of interpersonal neurobiology, and I'll come to it also. And also, um, one of the illustrations I have little later is about a premature babies which is something I don't know anything about, but um, illustrating the importance of personal input into physical life. So I thought if we are talking about life, we should ask the question, well, what is it mm. today? And without meaning to separate them, I thought I would give a scientific and a theological perspective to this one question. What is life? And... Um, the first person who asked this question was Erwin Schrödinger, who was a great physicist. He was an Austrian. Um, he ran away from Austria when Hitler came to power, and he ended up as professor of physics um, in Ireland, of all places. Um, and, of course, anybody who's done a little bit of chemistry or physics will know all about the Schrodinger wave equa equation, uh, the guy who really helped to uh, explain what electrons do as they whiz around an atom, a nucleus. And he wrote this book in 1944. And it's absolutely amazing to think that that's not so long ago. I mean, it's before I was born, so it is, in a way, a long time ago. But in the lifetime of people now living, there was no concept about the underlying mechanisms um, of heredity, for example. And Schrodinger was the first person to um, mention in this 1944 book the problem of coding. In other words, how does matter code for our biology? And up to that time, people had just used little algebraic signs for genes. A dominant gene might be big X, and a recessive gene might be little x. But Schrodinger, being a physicist, wanted to get to the basis of our heredity. What makes us what we are? And I haven't read his book, but a recent review says Schrodinger approached the gene not as an algebraic unit, but as a physical substance. So this was radical in 1944. A physical substance that had to be almost perfectly stable and yet express immense variety. And this review gives the example that 50 million years ago, India was crashing into the Asian landmass, and 8,000 meters of the Himalayas were being pushed up. 50 million years ago. But that time, at that time, the Hox genes, which determine our body plan, were already very, very well differentiated. And our ancestors, our biological whakapapa, going back to our earliest primate ancestors, they were already, um, they already had the basic primate body plan. So genes incredibly stable. And yet, the immense variety that we see amongst ourselves and other species. Of course, many years later, we have come to understand that this biological basis of our humanity um, is embedded in our DNA. And that's just a fish picture, fluorescence in situ hybridization of a male human set of genes, the male or the human carrier type. You can see the funny little X chromosome, which doesn't do anything for you except you're male. And there's a, sorry, the Y chromosome and the little X chromosome, of which females have two and males only have one. So, um, since 1944, the physical basis of heredity, and I'm using heredity as the example of our biological life. Obviously, we are more than our genes. 
Uh, I'm certainly not delving into um, Richard Dawkins' reductionism, but this is just the example I'm using. And if you work in a cytogenetics lab, that's how you characterize the human chromosome sets. So sets a little diagram just showing all the little bands. And the chromosomes, like Paul's letters, are numbered from long to short. And you can go a bit further. And you can line up, say, human chromosomes um, with the chromosomes of other species. And here the color coding is just to indicate blocks of, of very similar DNA. And we have human and chimp for each of um, the 22 chromosome pairs we have. And you can see that they are incredibly similar. So we are looking back now at our biological heritage as, as um, embodied beings. And there are a few major differences which are apparent. This was a, 19, a 2015 paper, sorry, which is pretty old now. But here they were basing the similarities, this color coding, on the basis of DNA sequencing, not just looking down a microscope now, but DNA sequencing um, and gene sequencing. And where I've drawn a red line, um, although you can't really see it here, I'll explain it a bit later, um, part of the chimp chromosome has been flipped 180 degrees. That's called an inversion. And it's the most common sort of chromosomal change occurring at the chromosome level. The only other difference is this asterisk here, where human chromosome 2 is a single chromosome, whereas the chimp and, in fact, the other great apes all contain two chromosomes. So what distinguishes us as human beings is an end-to-end <coughs> fusion of these two chromosomes to produce our own. So here is just the illustration of how random events, because genetic <coughs> events are random events, um, have intervened between the formation of our genome and that of a chimp. But certainly we have lots and lots in common. Now with a day of very detailed gene sequencing, so uh, our three billion base pairs have all been put into the right order in our genome, um, you can study in great detail the relationship of one species with another. So I've got here um, eight genes, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, in human beings and in chimp. And if they occur on the same linear sequence, um, A and A, B and B, C and C, you find um, a straight line. So that's a very sensitive way of using gene sequencing to show the collinearity of genes and therefore the similarity of our gene set with that of a chimp. Now, there's a wonderful website that I've got my next few slides from. And if I don't cover all this stuff, I'll, rip, I'll leave it behind because I don't want to run the second part of my talk short. Um, this now is based on uh, recent data on the Genomicus website. It's a wonderful interactive website um, looking at the human genome versus the chimp genome. And every box represents one chromosome. So chromosome 1, chromosome 19, chromosome 11, and here the order of genes, human and chimp, pretty much exactly the same. Although there are one or two discontinuities where we have those previously mentioned inversions. And we should expect inversions. Just imagine every nucleus in our body contains two meters of DNA. It's mind-boggling. Chromosome 1, our longest chromosome, is 16, uh, 16 centimetres long. That's a single molecule, 16 centimetres long. The shortest chromosome, 22, is 3 millimetres long. That's a single molecule, 3 millimetres long. So what are those inversions? Just imagine you have a loop of DNA. Now, that's a continuous loop. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. 
just imagine we put a break here and we rejoin the wrong ends. So we go A, E, D, C, B, F, G, H. So we change the order. And when you, this is an example of, yeah, of such an inversion which separates us from chimp. So here's our chromosome 17. Just imagine you break it here and here. You flip this bit, you rejoin it again, and you end up with a chimp gene. Same information, different order. Okay, see what's happened there? And so it looks like that when you plot linear sequence of, say, the human genome against the chimp genome. But we can go further. The gorilla is our next closest relative. And here are the color-coded chromosomes. Um, and here, once again, amazing similarity between our genomes in the order of our 20,000 genes. Um, but again, we've got uh, quite a few translocations which distinguish us from the gorilla. Again, it's an expression of our embodiment, if you like. What Maya was telling us about our embodiment in, in biology. We live in the zoosphere. There are also some chromosomes which seem to have been mixed around a bit. And that's a chromosomal translocation where they switch material. Again, well known to anybody who works in a, a, in a hospital lab, but they also occur in evolutionary time and they serve to scramble um, the chromosome sets between related species. So just imagine two chromosomes in human beings coming from our color-coded chromosome set, a break in one chromosome, a break in the other, and you join the wrong bits so that you exchange chromosome uh, arms or fragments of chromosomes. And then we can go further away in the orang utan. Um, our furthest great ape cousin. And again, you can see extraordinary similarity, but again, particular, largely inversion events. Um, and at this stage, I'm not going to go on too far, but you can also look at the human primate ancestor. So this is an inferred genome by comparing different primates. And you can see that this primate ancestor who lived 60 million years ago, according to current estimates, still has a genome pretty much like ours. So chromosome 1, pretty much the same, although there's a little weeny uh, inversion there, but it's still pretty much a rearranged version of our own. So, so life develops on randomness. And yet it produces order, right? This is one of the amazing things about life. Life, those chromosomal events are random. And yet they have produced creatures like you and me who can live not only in the zoosphere but in the noosphere. We can relate to God and the spiritual world. Schrodinger spoke of statistical mechanics. Now, I'm not a physicist, so ask John Dutton. Uh, so, Dutton? Dunlop. Me? Yes. No, I wouldn't call myself an authority. You're a <laughs> physicist. Well, he's the physicist, I'm not. <laughs> so, uh, st st statistical mechanics, the central conceptual framework used until his time to interpret the collective properties of matter. What does this mean? At the very micro level, everything is random. Okay? There's molecules jiggering around um, in a drop of water or something. But at the <coughs> macro level, that randomness emerges into order. <coughs> so for example, in a fly embryo, where a particular protein is produced at one end, Although individual molecules jigger around like crazy, they form an ordered gradient, a predictable gradient, which results in the formation of a fruit fly. And I think, I'm not a physicist again, but I've heard from Christian physicists what an amazing understanding this gives us, that the randomness of the micro world issues 
insights into the predictability and the order <coughs> of the macro world. <coughs> and that's one of the things that is remarkable about the physical basis of life. That the randomness in our cells, including DNA mutations, issues into the order of our bodies, of our physiology. Um, mathematical precision emerges from the apparent lawlessness of the flips of a coin, as each molecule randomly chooses to move left or right or up or down. So life gets hold of this randomness and feeds it into <coughs> all. Now this comes from Tom McLeish, who is a wonderful Christian physicist, and he writes similar things. So I'm getting, uh, starting to work towards um, a theological understanding of this. Tom McLeish says local chaos can give rise to large-scale structure when there are additional constraints. <coughs> Let nobody tell you that life is all random because we live in an anthropic universe <coughs> where God ordains the, 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 um, the limits in which that, order, that randomness operates. Creation harnesses the power of random forces without suppressing them but rather by directing them into paths and processes, even extending them to the processes of life itself. So Tom McLeish speaks of how randomness, its like life is like a ratchet, takes that randomness, but forms ordered <coughs> physiologies, ordered bodies, and ordered minds. So just think of the water moving in a... In, in a stream of water um, moving in a hydro uh, plant. That every movement is random. But the order generates power, um, drives economies, keeps us warm uh, in wintertime. So Tom McLeish again, the evolution of life is a natural process that falls into the category of all ordered large scale structure emergent from random small-scale dynamics. Random mutations, macroscopic properties of the developed organism. Interestingly, Tom Wright has a wonderful um, interpretation of the book of, jo of Job, which I think we often struggle with. Well, I've always struggled it when we read it, especially God's speeches at the end in chapters uh, 38 to 39 which almost seem to be a big put-down by God. Look, Job, you're thick. Just don't try to worry yourself. But um, to Tom McLeish, Job's ac ac uh, accusation is that God lacks control of creation and of people's lives. God, why have you let this happen to me? But God's answer is, Job, at the, at the local randomness of your own life, Sure, things happen which are painful and surprising. Look at my creation. Look at what it emerges into. Look at the phenomena of the universe and of life and of the clim climatic system. You see the randomness of, the, of your own micro scale emerges into the order of God's world where God is supreme. So that's a whistle-stop tour through randomness and emergent order. And hopefully we've addressed ever so briefly what um, Werner uh, Schrodinger says about what is life. The rest of my talk is St. Paul's, our, our quest, same question. Um, what is life? He is taking a different perspective on it. He's not thinking of our molecules or our DNA or the randomness <coughs> of mutations. He is speaking of the motivation and the drive and the underpinnings of, of life. What is life? To me, he says, 
it is Christ. Christ is the origin of my life. He is the continuance of my life. He is the end, the telos, the goal of my life. He is the one who makes it coherent, who motivates it, who gives it strength, the very source of my life. And uh, thank you, Maya, this verse which you quoted. Your real life, says Paul, is Christ. Your real life is Christ. And that speaks of the fullness of life in Christ. The authenticity of knowing, interpersonal knowing, okay? That interpersonal neuropsychology, although God doesn't have a neuropsychology, I guess. But it's the interaction of two minds. Life that has meaning life that reaches potential, uh, that is, at all times, dependent upon all uh, uh, others. Years ago, I bought this very precious little book, Biblical Creation and the Theory of Evolution. Um, and Douglas Spanner, who is a biophysicist and an Anglican uh, minister, had this to say, the biblical understanding of life connects it with knowing, existential knowing, that experience <coughs> of being in communication with other people like myself, being able to know that you look at me with a mind very much like the one with which I look at you. We have this relationship <coughs> with you. Life, biblically, implies entering into relationship with God, with other persons, and to a lesser extent, with things. So life exists in cognitive and responsive relationships with things and especially with persons. So the fullness of life is just not that radical materialism that Dawkins tells us about. Uh, but life is, in fact, the network of persons with whom we are engaged, which is not. I was just speaking to Bishop Peter uh, um, in our get-to-know-each-other get, get time. Um, no, I've forgotten what I said. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we Europeans are all um, tainted to some extent with the Enlightenment which <coughs> influences us and makes us all the poorer because we sort of denigrate relationship as being ontologically real. So let me give you an analogy. <coughs> Social animals cannot survive alone. They rely on members from their group to regulate their physiology. Okay? Coming back to that wonderful idea of interpersonal neuroscience. In a social species, individuals regulate one another's fundamental physiological processes. Survival depends on social bonds. Living is relating. Living is knowing. I don't have it on my slide, but one of my favorite verses when I give a science theology talk, eternal life is knowing you, the only true God, and knowing Jesus Christ whom you sent. Um, John chapter 17, verse 3. So there's this wonderful paper which came out in 2020, which looked at humans and a number of other uh, mammal species um, and showed that the quality of network integration, even with lower animals, so-called, um, relates to their physical well-being and existence. Several long-term studies in wild social animals have revealed unexpectedly strong links between the social environment and mortality risk. Okay. That's true of elephants, so, um, not elephants in this uh, study, but uh, rodents and, and dolphins and horses and even rock hyraxes at the bottom. So um, there is a strong relationship between social cohesion and biological life biological survival. Knowing is living. And for humans, this comes out of that paper, um, if you look at this axis on the extent of integration into a human social network, um, 
your lifespan increases. <coughs> and if you look at a number of different diseases, those diseases go down with integration into a social network. So that's why Paul can say, life is Christ. In a human sense, even in an animal sense, life is knowing. Life is being part of a community. Here's one of the studies from that, um, from that paper. In blue monkeys, females who maintain strong and consistent social bonds with the same partners live longest, but those with strong and inconsistent bonds fared the worst. So strong, consistent bonds feeds into biological survival. What is life? It is relationship and ultimately our relationship with Christ. Here is a paper that came out just last week um, looking at social connections in wild macaques. Social connections predict brain structure in a multidimensional, free-ranging primate society. Sorry, did you? Somebody? This is a summary diagram from that paper. Each of these circles represents a monkey. Green are males, purple are pink are females, and the bonds between them, which have been observed by somebody sitting and quietly uh, observe, watching how these critters <coughs> interact. There are sections through the brain, and again, you better speak to Maya because I don't know about brains, but there's the mid um, superior temporal salsus cluster and another cluster, the ventral. Uh, di disgranular insular cluster. Um, I've practiced learning those before this talk because I don't know much about them or anything about them. But um, the size of the social network determines the physical structure of those parts of the brain. See, this is top down, isn't it? It's top down, it's relationship affecting gene function and gene structure. And so the summary is a social network size operating via these bits of the brain result in biological stress. And interestingly, these bits of our brains in humans are involved in mentalization, my ability to relate to you, and in empathy. So they are there in macaques, developed more fully in humans so that we can act as moral and caring and worshipping beings. And now another study which came out even more recently and thank you Mary because this really fits in what you are saying. Here is a study looking at what happens to premature newborns and we can see all the wonderful high tech, tech wizardry there of an incubator for a newborn. The study is facilitating early parent-infant emotional connection improves cortical networks in preterm infants. Very premature babies often have um, cognitive problems <coughs> as the children grow up. But in this study, they went beyond the normal neotensive and neonatal intensive care unit with its associated later neurodevelopmental problems. And they brought in the mum four times a week, which doesn't seem all that much, and for one hour every day. And the mum held the baby, skin-skin contact, and spoke to it, eye-eye contact. And the baby smelt the mother. There was emotional connection, what they call on the paper kangaroo care, I guess think of a little joey, connected with its mother, even in a very undeveloped stage. So here was not the very radical intervention of a newborn with its mother. And just thinking what Mary was saying about a baby learning its mother's voice before birth. And here is a continuation of that moving beyond the biomedical model, recognizing that life, the very development of our brain, depends upon baby receiving its mother's love. So 
So that's what they did. They did the EEG. Um, then they worked out cortical networks. Don't ask me about how they do it. Then the spatial structure of regions in the brain. And then at 18 months, they looked at neurocognitive outcomes. How's baby doing with its language and its cognition? So that's just a picture of the study. And here is their conclusion. There's a section through the brain. Prematurity leading to physiological instability. Baby's not coping with this new world, this strange world of technology outside of its mother. White matter insult. That's the white matter. All the connections which carry signals and messages. And they suffer. Here is environmental enrichment, personal enrichment from the mother. Okay, mother pouring her love into this baby, affecting the physiology, affecting developing nerves, and improving <coughs> baby's mental capacity at 18 months. Jesus says, what gives life is God's spirit. The words I have spoken to you bring God's life, giving spirit. And I don't know how we can portray the the, the interactions of the Trinity. I know that looks very much like a system of levers and pulleys. I don't mean to imply that. Just the Father indwelling the Son, indwelling the Spirit. And as people redeemed by Christ, we are called into that fellowship. We are called into that relationship. That life-giving relationship. Again, um, one of many references to Paul in similar verses. If Christ lives in you, the Spirit is life for you because you have been put right with God. If the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from death lives in you, then he who raised Christ from death will also give life to your mortal bodies by the presence of his Spirit in you. Here's Wairua, Wairua the Holy Spirit, who gives life to our mortal bodies, not only now, but in the transformation um, which follows death. And of course, Paul speaks characteristically life in union with Christ. Life in union with Christ. There is no condemnation now for those who live in union with Christ. Although, as other speakers have mentioned, we live in this desperately um, impoverished world. Just one final quote from Brueggemann. We have turned from thou to I <coughs> in modernity. This is sort of the philosophies of the West. This in turn, this turn in modernity has given less than it promised. Indeed, not enough by which to live. Are we turning our backs on life and our obsession with things and with pursuits?